Okay, well, welcome everybody. This is um, Church History, the first lecture. Um, hope you're doing well. This is Dr. G. It is Good Friday as I am recording this lecture right now, and uh, you are seeing my PowerPoint uh, overview display for the first 21 chapters of Bruce Shelley's Church History in Plain Language. What I'm going to do with our lectures is, as I said, um, during our time uh, on Thursday night, the first meeting where we were uh, dialoguing together and getting to know each other, is I'm going to try to keep it all very simple and straightforward and in kind of an overview fashion. I mentioned before that while I'm not an expert per se in church history, I've taught it in a lot of different iterations and a lot of, a lot of different settings um, quite a bit with a particular focus on Pentecostal and charismatic history most recently and also other aspects or dimensions of history. Obviously when it comes to church history, which is 2000 plus years old, you're talking about a long uh, span of time, a lot of events, a lot of people and in a five week course in this um, kind of an application, the best we're going to be able to do is keep it, you know, sort of to the, the, the most simple and, and highlighted kind of moments and, and just move fairly quickly. So I'm saying all that to say, forgive me if I move too fast and or if we're not getting in depth enough in any given area or chapter, we just don't have the time to do that. But um, what I will say is that hopefully in an overview kind of a way, the time that we spend on this will give you a comprehensive, user-friendly view of church history. And the most logical uh, way to do it, as I said, is, is just overview the book. And that way you can dig into the book in any given section or chapter, and I would encourage you to do that uh, beyond just the 50-page um, requirements every week and dig into stuff that uh, interests you. In fact, the one and only assignment that we have beyond reading and paying attention to these lectures is a three-page paper at the end of the course, beginning part of May, where you're going to highlight a person or an event that really excites you. So if you find someone or something along the way, and there's plenty to pick from, that you find an interest in, uh, by all means, dig in. Go first to Bruce Shelley's book. You can go to other resources and books and find out more about that which interests you. But again, just keep in mind and remember, and please forgive me, that we're going to be moving fairly quickly and in an overview kind of a fashion um, just to cover all the material. Now, having said that, let me offer you up a thought in terms of how to apply church history because it is so big and wide and deep and sprawling and everything else. How to apply church history in sort of your ministry mindset or your, your philosophy for doing ministry, wherever you might find yourself. Uh, this is only one way to think about it. It's not a perfect way to think about it, but it might be helpful. Uh, and so I want to suggest it to you. Church history can be seen um, as a kind of a template of spiritual growth. By that I mean that the different issues, the different events, you know, the various um, major uh, transition points in history, not in the particular order that a new believer might encounter these in their own life and growth with the Lord, but in a thematic kind of an order, represent really all the big questions um, and issues that come up in the believer's life as they journey along and grow and mature. I've been walking with the Lord for the better part of 30 years, and I can tell you that as we think about church history and the different things, you know, whether it be heresies that come up that need to be put down and theology clarified, or it be the tension between uh, the church being in the world but not of the world, or, you know, how involved do we get in our faith and in our community of faith and in our church in the events of the world? Do we intertwine ourselves and all the details of life or do we stay you know more distant um, whether it be you know kind of the engaging evangelistic approach to being a believer and sharing your faith with others or a more uh, introverted and monastic and isolated approach you know on and on the different issues that come up in church history are actually uh, 
you know, the different issues and questions that come up during the course of a believer's life. So again, keeping it very simple and not in any way an exact science. One way to think about church history is that it can be kind of a map for you to uh, sort of evaluate your own life and maturity curve and also help others to evaluate theirs and to look to as a way to answer some of those questions. For instance, we'll talk in a minute about um, the chapter that deals with the incarnation of Christ and what the church did to clarify what that really means. Well, that's, you know, an issue that, that almost always comes up with new believers. They're converted, they begin to get into their Bibles, they begin to grow, they begin to ask questions about, well, what is this person, Jesus, all about that I've come to trust and know? Because, you know, obviously, as we're newly converted, we don't er know everything there is to know about God and so on. And, and the, the reality of Jesus being 100% man and 100% God almost inevitably comes up. Well, it did in the, in the history of the church, too, and they had to settle questions and wrong thinking about that and come to a clear and right thinking about that. You know, that would be an example. So, again, there's lots of ways to look at church history, uh, you know, in, in this class with a broad overview of 2,000 plus years of it. There's plenty to work with. That is the challenge. But one way to think about it might be, uh, you know, to keep it real and keep it a, applicable to your your ministry efforts is to think about it as a kind of a, a map for spiritual growth, you know, a sort of comprehensive chart for dealing with the, the typical issues. Maybe it's not every single issue. Certainly everybody has an individual walk with God, but all the major big issues and all the tension points and how do we deal with our power and authority and how do we, you know, behave as, I mean, it just, the list goes on and on. The church has wrestled with all those things. And um, as imperfect as it is, has come to some conclusions about a lot of important things. So think about it that way, maybe, you know, in terms of applying it toward um, your ministries. Okay, let's get into the book. Let's move quickly. We're going to cover actually 21 chapters today. Um, I had neglected to explain that, you know, because of the way this class is laid out and we had a week break and this is it. Uh, here on Good Friday for Easter week, we actually have ultimately two two lectures in one week this week. It's 1 through 21, the chapters in the book, and um, that'll cover you to discuss on um, April 16th, which is going to be our next Thursday night, this first portion of the book. That, in essence, covers week one and week two um, lectures. So in a sense, you're getting ahead. You're, you're not only getting a break uh, for Easter week, and I hope you're enjoying it and also finding some way to minister and uh, be engaged in this challenging time, but you're also going to sort of be ahead of the game as you preview this, either this upcoming weekend or the beginning of the week before next Thursday's uh, discussion. All right, so what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the foreword, the prologue, chapters one and two, uh, really basically three big sections in Shelley's book spanning from the age of Jesus and the apostles through the Christian Middle Ages, only 1,500 years worth of history. So, yeah, like I said, we're going to cover a lot in a hurry, okay? So let me scroll down here and move. All right, forward and prologue. The goal of the textbook is to lead evangelical readers to engage their own story and encounter the larger Christian world. And I said one way to possibly do that is to think about church history in the paradigm that I just suggested as a map for spiritual growth. But why is this important? Well, it's important because we as evangelicals find ourselves within a particular major stream of Christian tradition, but not the only one, certainly. And perhaps not even the most important one in the big, uh, wide sweep of Christian tradition. Um, you know, as evangelicals, we have four distinct beliefs amongst a lot of different beliefs that our own particular group, again, whether we be Pentecostal or charismatic or fundamentalist or whatever, you know, substripe of evangelical is the broadest term. We believe that the Bible is in, uh, inerrant, meaning it's without error in the original text. 
that salvation is, is exclusively found in Christ, that it must be individually embraced, and that sharing salvation or sharing the evangel, the good news, is a requirement, not an option of our faith. That's basically what it means to be an evangelical in the most general sense. So what we're doing in, in reviewing Christian history is really placing ourselves, aren't we, in a context. And as we said the first night together, I said, and I believe it's true, context is super important because without understanding context, we don't understand really much of anything. And, um, you know, whether it be the life of Jesus in his historical context, which is a class I teach uh, up to 15 weeks long, or it's some other topic like church history, contextualizing is super, super important, okay? Um, the key points of you know, this presentation. Uh, overall, uh, you know, this is kind of what we're going to look at over the next five weeks. There are nine major divisions or time periods in Bruce Shelley's book. Those are artificial but helpful. Uh, in the foreword and prologue, he does a pretty good job of qualifying how he's approaching church history. And while it's not perfectly uh, fluid in the historical sense, properly speaking, it is arranged in a way that is super user-friendly for us. And um, the time frame sort of uh, segmentation and then the development of each chapter is really user friendly. The plot of church history then can be um, sort of explored at different layers and levels. The easiest way is just to look at the chapter headings and then to go to the major title pages for each of the nine sections and read the paragraph or two description that captures. You know, really the essence of that particular time frame, however many years it might uh, go or flow. And, and then you get a sense of, you know, what that time period is essentially about. You don't get a ton of detail, but you get a, a handle on it. Um, immediately after that, and this is a great way to read the book uh, in kind of a fast and overview fashion rather than slogging through it word for word, sentence by sentence, page by page, is that you can read the introductory paragraph of each of the subsection chapters, chapters one, two, three, four, and so on. And within the first um, few paragraphs, or sometimes in the, in the second section, but immediately uh, within the, you know, that first couple pages, you're gonna find a question is posed. And on each of the slides you'll see upcoming here in a moment, I've highlighted these different segments very clearly, and I've presented for each slide, which is a chapter in the book, um, the question itself that that chapter deals with. There's one question essentially that each chapter in the whole of the book, so the first 21 deals with 21 questions, right? Each chapter deals with one essential question. So it makes it really easy, and then it also makes it so that the chapters in um, the book are sort of self-contained, like, in a, you know, uh, uh, kind of parts of the whole, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica type segmentation, so that you can look at each of the chapters if you really want to zero in on one question or one issue and, you know, kind of find, find that material there, okay? So this will become more clear as we unfold the, the PowerPoint here, but basically you're going to see a slide for each of the major divisions, and I'm going to cover those. You're going to see a slide for every chapter, just one, and we're going to cover each chapter in one slide. And again, I'm going to move quickly, and I'm going to give you, in essence, an overview, everything you need for each of those chapters. That way, too, you're not only getting a great structured overview of church history as it flows in the book, in this PowerPoint series, you're also getting a guide to the book. So if you haven't gotten the book, or you haven't read the book, or you're only doing 50 or 40 pages a week, and that's all your schedule allows, friends, you're not going to miss anything if you just pay attention to the lectures, because we're going to cover everything anyway. If you can read, great. If you can read 50 pages, awesome. If you can read even more, hey, go for it. Good for you. You're going to get more out of the class. But if all you can do is the lectures, trust me, you're not going to miss anything. And if you can attend on Thursday nights and just do the three-page paper at the, the end, you're going to be good to go. Okay? So super easy-friendly, super easy. 
this is how the overall plan of the book lays out. Let's, let's get into the first major division, okay? First major division is basically um, this, the age of Jesus and the apostles, and it encompasses really the first two chapters of the book. Uh, let me just read from the slide so you can, you know, get a sense of it. This period of time from 6 BC to AD 70 is Christianity's roots, and they go back into Jewish history long before the birth of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus of Nazareth, however, who attacked established Judaism and brought a revival movement into history's light early in the first century. After his crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, a Roman official, Jesus' teaching spread through uh, out the Mediterranean area. In other words, Pontius Pilate was a Roman official uh, who crucified Jesus. We know that. An apostle named Paul was especially influential. He stressed God's gift of salvation for all men and thus led in Christianity's emergence from Palestinian Judaism to a position as a universal religion. All right, chapter one and chapter two basically deal with, first of all, the life of Jesus, and then second, the book of Acts and the ministries of Peter and Paul. So it's really simple and straightforward. Let me say before we jump into one and two, that if you're looking for a really helpful summary for your ministry, for your preaching, teaching, for your sharing with other people, for leading a small group, whatever it is, boy, I got to tell you something. And again, it comes from my teaching both of these subjects in a more detailed and protracted way in university classes. The chapter one and chapter two of this book are worth the whole book because they're really good, comprehensive, not too technical summaries. First, of the life of, excuse me, the life of Jesus, and then second, of the lives and ministries of the apostles Peter and Paul. So, you know, again, super user-friendly, easy to read, quick to read. If you're looking for a way to capture in just a few pages, you know, some really big subjects, the first four Gospels, or in chapter two, the book of Acts, you, you've got a really user-friendly summary set right here, all right? All right, now, chapter one, Away with the King is the title of the chapter, otherwise known as the Jesus Movement, and the key question in chapter one is, did Jesus have anything to do with the formation of the Christian church? And if he did, how did he shape its special character? Well, the chapter covers a lot of context. It sets the stage for Palestine and Jesus' life in his day. That period of time that involves uh, the return from exile of the Jews and then some occupation and some sectarianism and some uh, freedom under the Maccabees and then beyond that, the Roman occupation that really sets the stage for Jesus' coming uh, and his baptism and the inauguration of his ministry. Then it, it presents, you know, a summary of Jesus' ministry, his teaching, the major events that take place, um, his healings, all that kind of good stuff, and, and some of the thematic material of the topic of the kingdom of God, which is the major message of the Gospels in Jesus' life. That is to say, the Gospel is the message of the kingdom. And, you know, essentially you need to know that, a lot of people don't understand, that Jesus' message isn't just the gospel, it's the gospel embedded in this thing called the kingdom of God, which is the rule and reign of God, which gives birth to the people of God, who then formulate what's called the church. So that, and I wish we had more time to, you know, explore this, but it's super important for active, practical ministry. The kingdom of God, the community of believers who have trusted in Jesus, and the church as an institution are three separate but overlaid, interconnected realities. I'll say that again. The kingdom of God is the rule and the reign of God. That when people encounter the kingdom, the rule and reign of God, often... Uh, fall under conviction and come to a place of committing their lives to the king of the kingdom, who is Jesus Christ. They're converted, right, and they become a part of the community of believers. 
But the community of believers is not the kingdom. It's the community of believers. And the community of believers is also not the church, which is ultimately made up of a community of believers in an organized institutional, in some form or another, gathering of those believers. So again, I wish we had more time to discuss that, but it is important to understand for us ministers that the kingdom, the community of believers, and the church are not the same thing. They're three separate distinct things that have an overlapping significance together. In one way, you know, you could, you could say that one leads to the other, okay? But when we talk about, you know, church history, we're talking about really studying the organized, formulized, institutional expressions of the community of believers that comes from the rule and reign of God as it spreads through the world. So, super important to clarify. In the last part of chapter 1, of course, then, the end of Jesus's earthly life and ministry, the Passion Week, which we're commemorating this week uh, in one fashion or another, the covenant uh, created um, on the cross and through Jesus's uh, sacrifice, this new covenant, as the New Testament is called, and then the trial, death, and resurrection of Jesus, then leading us to the book of Acts is uh, sort of summarized. So, in answer to the key question for chapter one, then Jesus founded the church in the sense of establishing a society apart from any other, that would be the community of believers, loyal only to God, by making it known through his life and ministry that the kingdom of God was available here and now, right in front of you, as he says, um, you know, just an arm's reach away. So that's how all that works. And again, it's a great uh, summary of the life of Jesus in chapter one, okay? In chapter two, then we move on to the book of Acts, this idea that Christianity in its kingdom dynamic breaks away from Judaism slowly but surely, um, initially and abruptly and then ongoingly as the apostles uh, begin to share their message uh, being firsthand witnesses of the life, death, and resurrection, and, and then soon, very soon in the book of Acts, the ascension, which is an important part of the, you know, kerygma or gospel framework message of the New Testament. How did Christianity emerge from its Jewish roots? Well, chapter two sort of summarizes that, and the key points are really inclusive in understanding the scope of Christianity going beyond the scope of Judaism, that is to say, becoming far more inclusive than Judaism, which even today in its, all of its expressions, but the Orthodox expression in particular, is a fairly exclusive religion. It's not easy to join, in other words. Christianity is really all about being outward focused and, and being available to everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. Um, the chapter summarizes the Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit and the enabling of the believers to move into what the author accurately calls a, a new wineskin, in other words, a new dynamic form beyond the forms of Judaism and all of its legalism and synagogue uh, structure and, and, you know, sort of religious temple-derived structures and practices and rituals, including the Passover and so on. Um, the first community of believers carries forth the two things that distinguish the Christian community uh, uniquely, and that is baptism and communion, both of which are derived from Judaistic practices, but now are renewed and redefined for the Christian community. And then the spread of um, this kingdom dynamic and community of believers, both Jew and Gentile, into the Hellenistic world, which is the um, cultural overlay that Alexander the, the, the Great brings to the ancient world, uh, bringing what will be first Greco and then ultimately Greco-Roman culture. Alexander brought the Greco because he was Greek but will ultimately in human history be called the Greco-Roman culture because the Romans borrow so heavily when they come into power from the Greeks. Um, this, this idea of philosophy and the arts and culture and so on, that 
um, intermingles with more primitive Judaistic and Christian belief and creates both challenges and opportunities to appreciating, uh, again, it's all about context, right? What the gospel message means to people as they evolve and grow um, in human culture. The Apostle Paul, of course, focuses his message on the Gentiles, who many of whom are Hellenists, most, but not all, and none of whom, of course, are all that familiar with the Jewish religion. So it's an interesting situation where Peter, who is, you know, essentially trained in Judaism, but um, not as formally trained as Paul, uh, is called as the apostle to the Jews, and Paul, who is highly trained, he's a rabbi, um, you know, and, uh, and a scholar and so on, in the Jewish religion, is called to people that don't know anything about it, really, in the Gentile world. So you have an interesting opposites attract kind of a dynamic happening. The chapter uh, ends with the decline of Jerusalem and the War of the Jews, as it's called, and the fall of Jerusalem under the Romans in AD 70, and how that uh, period of time really marks the end of the apostolic age and how Christianity begins to flow and flourish in the much greater, largely Gentile, although there are diaspora dispersed Jews throughout the ancient world. Uh, and in the impact that it begins to make. So how did Christianity emerge from its Jewish, root, Jewish roots? Well, Jesus' message, message appealed to the lost sheep of Israel, but was in reality a much larger message with a wider scope and spreads via the ministries of Peter and Paul, but particularly Paul, to the non-Jewish world. Okay, so that's chapter 2. The second major division in the book now begins with the end of that apostolic era and the book of Acts, the early church period, as we would call it sort of generally, and the age of Catholic Christianity um, in the most general sense, not the formalized Roman Catholic institutional Christianity quite yet, but Catholic in the lowercase c universal sense. The word Catholic means universal. So, you know, the church begins to spread beyond the Jewish uh, realm of Palestine. I don't like to use that word because a lot of Jewish people take offense at it, and I understand why, but it's geographically correct uh, for the time period involved. Moving beyond, you know, that very uh, Israel-rooted area, Syria, you know, um, Arabia and so on, that Middle Eastern area to the larger Mediterranean world. In this period, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire and probably east to India. Christians realized that they were a part of a rapidly expanding movement really across the globe as it was known back then, at least in you know, the more settled and civilized areas that became the root of the West. There's African tradition, there's Asian tradition, there's a lot of histories going on right now, but in terms of the West and what will ultimately become uh, Europe and the, the birthplace of the, the American experience, uh, that's what they're referring to. This suggested that it was universal in spite of pagan ridicule and Roman persecution, and it was the true faith in opposition to all the perversions of Jesus' teaching that existed at the time. To face the challenges of their times, Christians turned increasingly to their bishops for spiritual leadership. Catholic Christianity, therefore, is marked by a universal vision, by orthodox beliefs, and by an Episcopal church government. So what you see in this period, beginning now with chapter 3, is the formulation of the more institutional forms of the church. First and foremost, you know, the spread of it becoming more localized in the Gentile Mediterranean world, largely Gentile Mediterranean world, and then the formulation of structure and leadership to it that's both uh, necessary and, and required to, to lead a group of, uh, of people. In um, chapter three, we begin to talk about only worthless people or Catholic Christianity in the sense of its appeal to um, the less than uh, 
rich, influential, and powerful. Now, having said that, let me just say something that this chapter doesn't get into, which is um, the fact that a lot of rich and wealthy Christians in the Roman Empire were immediately converted. And in fact, in the Roman training schools of the highest order, Christian influence began to penetrate early. However, by and large, you know, the, the Christian message was for the common people, and most people were the common people, like in any other human culture in the Roman Empire. There were only a handful of people, relatively speaking, that were really in charge. And so Christianity penetrated all levels of the culture, but the greatest number of population, the greatest number of people, are what we might call the common or lower classes. So, you know, on the whole, Christianity spreads like wildfire amongst most people uh, of whom, you know, are, are not rich and wealthy and influential. Key question in this chapter is how did the scattered congregations of apostolic times become universal or Catholic Christianity? So the chapter talks about the spread of the faith amongst the God-fearers. Those are Gentiles who are God-conscious. They're aware that there's a God, that there's you know, a universe that's created uh, uh, with a structure of good and evil, right and wrong, so on. Um, you know, and, and it's it's really amongst people that have an awareness of some kind of God, have some sort of interest in spiritual questions and things that begin to gravitate toward Christianity first. The faith spreads basically from east to west in the Mediterranean world through every society and culture. And the social impact of the gospel um, really gets people to respond both as recipients of and transmitters of a very strong witness, the need for help to make sense of life, to, to live a life that was beyond the brutish, short, uh, you know, <laughs> unpleasant, excuse me, painful experience of most people in the ancient world who uh, found life difficult at best and didn't live super long lives because of the lack of technology and science and medicine and so on. And the practical kindness that was in contrast to the more brutal aspects of what it meant to live in the context of an empire that was known for its power you know, Rome will become an empire that has a lot of inner contradictions. One of them is that it's one of the most powerful imperial, uh, you know, militaristic, violence-driven cultures to ever establish itself on planet Earth. At the same time, <coughs> excuse me, Rome is known for its Pax Romana, That is, because of its power, its ability to secure large swaths of peaceful civilization in its wake, to give people a chance to live in, you know, conditions and at least rudimentary economic um, structure that provides a, some kind of a life to them, to settle a home, to, you know, till a farm, that kind of thing. So. Um, Christianity becomes early in the in the Roman Empire a super attractive thing in a world that's really hard to live in and survive in for very long. The answer to the question then is, you know, by slow and steady growth in societies driven by a burning conviction in the hearts of witnesses, by meeting the felt need for inner peace via the spirit and the practical outworking of Christian love in a brutal and uncaring world, the Christian faith spreads um, from scattered congregations of the apostolic period to a much more broad and sweeping uh, establishment throughout all different contexts and layers of the Mediterranean world under the rule mostly of the, of the Roman Empire. Okay, Chapter 4 um, opens up a whole new topic in Rome's sort of evolution. The chapter title is called If the Tiber Floods, and it refers to the beginning of persecution of Christians within the Roman Empire. 
Christianity becomes so popular, so widespread, that it begins in some unique ways to threaten Roman sensibility. So the question for this chapter becomes, why then did Rome persecute Christians? And the answer has a couple of different layers to it. In the chapter, we talk about Rome's policy of religion. And that combined with the Jewish rejection of this thing called the Christian sect or the way pushes Christianity out into a place where it has to exist on its own. And because it has such an outward focus, unlike the Jewish religion, which is fairly exclusive and again, hard to join, which the Romans were perfectly fine with because the Romans generally just adopted everybody's religious systems into their own. And as long as everybody worshiped the emperor, everybody was good. They could practice in addition to that in a secondary way, whatever they wanted to. The Christians had a different orientation and they were outward focused toward everyone. And ultimately, as we'll see, had no real interest in worshiping the emperor. So certain tensions begin to set up. Also lifestyle choices mirrored in new Christian converts. This idea of holiness as being different from the culture, as rejecting things like infanticide and child sacrifice and divorce and sexual immorality and economic immorality and oppression and all the kinds of things that were pretty common in the Roman Empire that Christians didn't want to be a part of and so they started to stand out in a good way but for the Romans in a threatening way. And then there were, uh, as always happens in human culture, but particularly highly broken human culture, like the Roman culture at the time, unfair false rumors of sexual deviance and cannibalism. Communion became kind of a misunderstood practice, this idea of drinking my blood and eating my flesh, metaphorically as it's described by Christians in that ceremony was taken literally by many Romans. And so all kinds of crazy rumors started popping up and, and people just frankly began to turn on Christians. And of course, we all know that there's a spiritual dynamic to that too. But uh, you know that added a lot of fuel to the persecution fire. Um, ultimately, the Christians did not want to worship the emperor or Caesar as God. And that was a huge sticking point because for the Romans, they didn't really care who you worshiped as long as you put Caesar first and everybody else second. You could be Jewish, you could be, you know, a pagan idolater, you could be any number of different variations on the theme. Just don't mess with Caesar's place and you're, you're fine. Well, the Christians couldn't deal with that, of course. And so that major tension was like the spark that started the fire of persecution. So the answer is, why did Rome persecute the Christians? Well, Christian resistance to compromise on a daily level and on the affirmation of the maxim that Caesar is Lord made them seem intolerant, stubborn, and disloyal, and thus sort of opened hunting season on the Christians in the Roman uh, society and culture. So this chapter deals with the beginnings of that. Persecution will happen over generations. It's going to happen over hundreds of years. In some ways, it never goes away. Uh, in some strange ways, way later on, as we'll see with the Inquisition, it morphs into uh, the persecution of believers as heretics. And, you know, some weird uh, variations on that theme, you know, get worked through but this is where it, it begins okay in chapter five um, we see the rise of orthodox who are in this chapter arguing about what actually happened in the life and the ministry and message of jesus what was really being communicated begins in earnest in a in an initial and beginning way the key question in this chapter is what did early christians believe and why did they consider these beliefs only orthodox and so the chapter covers uh, the emergence of, you know, more um, systematic and formalized and detailed theology. What a commitment to Christ and rational thought about God and how we live that out in daily life. Um, 
what that looks like and how we how we actually flesh it out. Incidentally, um, you know, in our age, 21 centuries later, in the 21st century, you know, the biggest issue that we face as believers these days is not that people don't believe in Jesus, but that they struggle in the 21st century post or late modern context, living a life that accurately reflects what it means to believe in Jesus, right? So for those of us in ministry, our big challenge is not so much preaching the gospel and getting people saved. That's always an issue. But our big challenge is discipleship helping people to grow into what looks like a Christian versus someone who just says they are, <clears throat> but is living a lifestyle that's not reflective of the character and the person of Jesus Christ himself. Okay. Going back to the rise of orthodoxy. Um, one of the big things that happens in this period of time is that heresies start to challenge uh, what people believe. There's a lot of divergent ideas about what the, real story was on Jesus, his life, his death and resurrection. And ultimately, um, you know, the church as it is formulating itself goes back rightly to the apostolic witness and says, look, basically the apostles walked and talked with Jesus. They saw him, they knew him, they lived with him, they watched him die and come back again. They ought to know what they're talking about. So let's just focus on their message. And that becomes what we essentially in a root way call orthodoxy the men who knew uh, the apostles stand in contrast to the gnostics and others who claim to have some form or another of secret knowledge revelation mystical insight into who jesus is in a secondhand way versus the reliable testimony of the witnesses who knew him firsthand um, the dangers of knowing in the Gnostic sense have never left us. They continue to haunt <laughs> human and church activity. Uh, Dan Brown's uh, novel, The Da Vinci Code, if you, know, you need a, uh, an example from the 21st century of uh, what Gnostic belief can lead to and look like in all of its insanity, uh, no matter how popular and entertaining a story it was, it was you know mostly based on Gnostic Christian mythology, and most of it totally and inappropriately put together. No real solid research. That's an example of our current context struggle with secret knowledge and the Gnostics. I'm not poo-pooing or bad mouthing Dan Brown. I'm just saying the book is really from historical religious standpoint, complete garbage. The story's fun to, you know, <laughs> know about, but but really, you know, the, the idea of mystical knowledge that just, you know, comes as a revelatory breakthrough and really has no root in the actual Christian witness is, is the danger of knowing in the Gnostic sense. Okay, chapter five then answers the question, what did early Christians believe and how did they arrive at a place of orthodoxy is the measure by formulating the Apostles Creed which is the best summary of early Christian belief describing the essential elements of the gospel that penetrate man's need for transformation of his affections providing him a savior to refocus his love from wrong things to a right God the essence of man's problem and God's solution to the problem is not secret knowledge or revelational mystical power or or breakthrough or self-actualization or anything else it's the core problem that we as human beings have always had which is our affections that which we want to spend our time energy and and focus on are warped we're sinful we need a savior and that's the essence of you know who jesus is in the coming of him as king of the kingdom he's come to save us right he's our savior and our Lord, he's come to rescue us from our warped uh, hungers and affections and transform what we desire in life to something that is more reflective of what God intended from the beginning to give us life. And so orthodoxy in a very you know, simple sense becomes the definition of that. You know, what is the core of the gospel? It's come to transform us into the humans that God wanted us to be to begin with, not the fallen and twisted and perverse creatures that we've become, right? Okay. Uh, 
Chapter 6, the rule of books. This chapter deals with the formation, at least in a beginning way, by that I mean the canonization of the scripture. How do we get the Protestant Bible? Why is it different from the Catholic Bible? Um, why are the Mormon books different than, you know, on and on the questions go. How do we get the Bible becomes the topic and the question for this particular chapter. And so in brief, it's a good little study on the question of early writings, the Apocrypha, which are books not accepted to be legitimate in the sense of uh, apostolic authorship or inspiration from the Holy Spirit, but nonetheless, decent documents that are not, you know, misleading or deceptive by definition, they're just not scripture. And, you know, how we arrived at understanding what scripture was, which was, you know, basically according to three criteria. That is, the scriptures that ultimately became the Bible that we study and read today and the Protestant uh, and only legitimate version, as we say, from our tradition, are first of all self-evidencing writings, meaning that they're inspired. There's something different about them when you read them. Most believers can, in, in a beginning way, affirm that. They read the Bible and it's different than other uh, literature, other writing. If you've never read an apocryphal book, I would encourage you to read it and see what the difference is in terms of how you perceive and feel about it when you read it compared to scripture. Open your Bible on one hand, open an apocryphal book on the other and read the two and see if you can tell the difference. It's an exercise I've done in classes that I've taught. It's really revealing and affirming of this self-evidential quality of the scripture. Also, you have to understand that over a long period of time, but relatively short in terms of you know church history, the scriptures as we've canonized them, put them together in, a, in the rule of the book um, today, were used in Christian worship and all the churches regularly for generations. So these were documents, letters, you know, books that were regularly utilized by the church and so therefore were proven to be uh, fruitful in their study and in their, um, their use as a training tool, a doctrinal tool. And so they didn't just come out of the blue. You know, these were books that the church and the members, the community of faith, were uh, gravitating toward and using just by way of a leading of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, not all, but most of the books of the New Testament were written by the apostles themselves. So you have those three criteria. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion about how the New Testament got formulated, how it got tacked onto the old, whether it's open or closed, it's closed now, meaning you can't add any more books to it. And then the role of um, the superintention of the Holy Spirit and how there, are been, there have been a myriad of other uh, people claim to be inspired when they're not. And, you know, just the whole conversation in this chapter about how we parse the difference between truly Holy Spirit inspired and recorded scripture and everything else, okay? So the answer to the question in this chapter is that through the churches, basically, we get the Bible, and in their desire to submit fully to the teaching of the apostles, which shaped the character of Christianity through the forming of the canon of scripture, causing the faith to remain universal or Catholic, because it was rooted again, in the apostolic witness. If you have any doubt, you know, ultimately about how we know what we know, the safest, best, most secure place to always go is to the apostolic witness. That is to say, the writings of the apostles, right? I mean, Peter knew Jesus. Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. You know, all the rest of the apostles were personal witnesses. Chances are, if you're, you know, going to believe anybody about who Jesus is, first place you ought to go, common sense, is to the people that know him. And so, you know, that's the idea of the apostolic witness and how that translates into the canon of scripture or the formulation of the Bible is the, the topic of chapter six. Okay. Chapter seven starts conversation about the power of bishops, that is to say, leadership roles in the church, 
which prior to had been a little bit less formal and now become, uh, you know, more formalized and institutionalized. And the, the key question in this chapter called the School for Sinners is, are there sins after baptism for which there is no forgiveness? The issue here, folks, is that, you know, active day-to-day -day in the here and now, or what we might call real-time application of the gospel, became an issue because the essential belief was that when you got converted and baptized and you were saved from your sins, cleansed from your sins, and, you know, now you're happily released to go on your way and live life. Well, the problem is, of course, <clears throat> that we're all still working our way through the vestiges of sin. So the questions relating to sanctification, maturation, and growth become relevant. And the, the real and pressing need to, to answer, well, what happens if you're saved and baptized and then you go back and sin again? Are you lost again? Do you have to get reconverted? becomes the central issue for the establishment of leadership that can ongoingly apply the efficacy of Christ's work in daily life. That is the dispensation of forgiveness and, and the elements of communion. You know, it all becomes, in the more formalized sense, a hugely ritualistic Catholic system in the end of the, the story. But here at the beginning, it's really all about how do we live out this gospel life in real time? And what does it mean to be forgiven of sins? Are we forgiven just once and then we have to stay, you know, clean and pure? Or do we be more honest about it and realize that we're constantly struggling and that Christ's death on the cross covers all sins past, present, and future? How does that work out in our experience? What do, how do the leaders, you know, uh, help? clarify <laughs> how we process that and so on. So the chapter deals with that, deals with the establishment of bishops and what a bishop is, the result of a more formalized leadership structure for people that are quote unquote in the ministry to lead worship and provide discipline and training and teaching and, and discipleship and all the rest. This is the rise really of the the clergy versus the laity, the coming of the episcopacy ushers out the role of the spirit in many ways so that church government becomes more, becomes more formalized and more human oriented versus the more dynamic spirit led organic experience of the earlier church. That incidentally leads to ongoing conversation today about what the form of the church is actually really supposed to look like and you know, as we've talked already in our dialogue about denominations and different groups and so on and so forth, you know, that's part of the conversation is how formalized does the church really need to be? Aren't we all filled with the spirit? Can't we lead ourselves or do we need leaders? You know, on and on, you know, that, that conversation goes. And then, of course, the question of the unforgivable sin, what's the role of church membership and admission? What happens if a person gets, quote unquote, excommunicated or kicked out of the church? What's the role of saints? That is people that really are standout examples of growth and transformation and maturation. Uh, penance, how do we make up for our sins? You know, these are all really practical theological questions, not all of which are answered well, but that give birth to the need for a more structured leadership. And that's what the chapter is about. The church grants to bishops the power to forgive sins, thus completing the Catholic Christianity, you know, in its expressions on down to the street. And the orthodoxy that becomes really ultimately institution in the days leading from this period, okay? Chapter 8 begins to explore now sort of the development of Christianity as it impacts the intellectual scene in the ancient world, excuse me, ancient world. And the Alexandrians become the question, focus point for this chapter called Apostles to the Intellectuals. The key question here in chapter eight being, what is Christianity's role in the affairs of men and empires? That is to say, how do we reconcile or how do we square <clears throat> 
our growing intellectual achievements as human beings with the simplicity and offense of a gospel that says, really basically it doesn't matter how smart you are, you still need a savior and your real problem is what's going on in your soul and in your heart, not in your head, although your head is involved, if that makes sense. The key points in this chapter really you know, deal with the light in the world, the dual role of the church as both being of the world, but um, that is to say in the world, but not of the world, excuse me, in the world, but not of the world. That is to say how the church functions as being separate from, but engaged with the world and its systems. Um, it deals with uh, Pantaneus and Clement, the first Christian scholar who give birth to origins, early academic and intellectual genius origin as a scholar and intellectual uh, believer who really sets a foundation for the thirst of uh, for the truth and how that integrates with Hellenistic remember I mentioned that earlier Greek thought more sophisticated thought in art and culture and music and you know um, philosophy and history the advancing intellectual uh, uh, development of the civilization that doesn't always align with gospel truth. How do we, you know, make sense of what's most important to know and what's best to believe and how we conduct our lives in accordance with the influx of ever increasing human effort based knowledge, um, the theology for thinkers that becomes systematic theology. I think we all know, but if we don't, that there's basically two forms or types of theology out there. One's called biblical and the other is systematic. Biblical looks at the Bible from start to finish and asks questions in terms of what the Bible reveals in the order in which it is laid out. Systematic theology deals with topics. What does the Bible say about angels? What does the Bible say about redemption? What does the Bible say about Jesus Christ? And instead of dealing with answering questions as they emerge in the flow of biblical history, systematic theology attempts to systemize theology, to ask about topics and then go to the scripture to find the answer to those topics versus the other way around. So the rise of systematic theology as an intellectual pursuit is really what chapter eight is about. The answer then to the question about Christianity's role in the affairs of men is that it's, it's very central. A very central role for Christianity is established as all truth, uh, as Thomas Aquinas will later fully establish, becomes seen as God's truth, and that all truth really is derivative of the, cru the, the truth of Christ. Colossians is a great place to go, right? Colossians 1, where we're, we're told about and described, what's described for us is the supremacy of Christ as the one who holds all truth and authority, as John 1 says, the logos or the logos, the, the um, overriding governing truth principle of the universe is Christ. So that all of human intellectual discovery and um, innovation has to come under the canopy of the authority of Christ, who is the truth. He doesn't just speak the truth. He is the embodiment or the incarnation of truth. So that's what happens in chapter 8 in terms of exploring the tensions that exist between human intellect and revelational truth and where we find common ground between the two. That ends the second major division and moves us into the third major division which is entitled The Age of the Christian Roman Empire and spans the time frame from AD 312 to 590, that is to say AD 590. In this period, a character named Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, becomes kind of a big major player. So the Emperor Constantine is one of the major figures of Christian history after his conversion as the Emperor of Rome. Christianity moves swiftly from the seclusion of the catacombs and persecution to the prestige of palaces. Major shift in how Christianity is seen, dealt with, 
and the role it plays in human culture, right? The movement started the fourth century as a persecuted minority and ended the century as the established religion of the empire. Thus, the Christian church was joined, <coughs> excuse me, to the power of the state and assumed a moral responsibility for the whole society. Initially, under the instruction of Constantine, the church refined its doctrine and developed its structure. Some, as the historian Eusebius says, saw Constantine's embrace of Christianity as its victory over the empire. Others, such as the monks, believed the culture, the culture was capturing Christianity. In other words, they didn't like the idea. However you parse it, though, the story that follows is the Christianizing of the great Hellenistic mindset and world. When the empire gave way to barbarian invaders later on, known as Europeans today, in other words, when the fall of the Roman Empire begins to take place, and it takes place over a long period of time, the monks ironically won over the conquerors, and the monks displayed the dignity of a well-ordered life and community with deep roots in the Christian faith, which will set the stage for the Middle Ages and um, what comes after that. Okay, so this is a huge segment of history. We begin to really explore the role of Constantine and, you know, the popularization and indeed the imperialization of the faith as the national religion of the Roman Empire in this chapter 9, entitled Laying Her Sucker Down, The Conversion of the Empire. The key question in this chapter is, why and how did the despised and persecuted Christian faith rapidly assume spiritual leadership over the Roman Empire? How did that happen? And of course, you know, again, Constantine becomes a huge player in this, but um, the empire begins to turn with the Augusti division of power by Diocletian. On the Roman political side, there isn't just one emperor, but there are multiple emperors, and there's a struggle for power. And instead of one guy or, or girl, although in this case it would have been male men, uh, ruling the empire, there's a division of power, and that creates all of its own tensions and problems. Um, in the middle of that, the Christians under Diocletian are persecuted perhaps, you know, in, in, in the most vile and violent sense. Although you could argue that Nero did a pretty good job of destroying Christians and other emperors did too. Diocletian reaches um, a peak point in his uh, persecution of Christians, which is a terrible chapter in the history of the faith. But then Constantine, who really rises to power as one of the, the big four, is converted. His conversion happens during a battle that convinces him that Christ's power is, uh, you know, active in the world and blessing him in his life and his destiny. And so the church comes to power as the emperor himself who rises to primary power over Diocletian's power divisions takes control. And so now, you know, there's this confusing perhaps, but also powerful realization that the emperor is not only quote unquote God, he's a Christian. And so he's what, a Christian God? Or, you know, there, again, it's a little confusing, but the end result for Christianity is it, you know, propels the faith into a place of being uh, vindicated and legitimized by the emperor himself and promoted as the required religion of the empire. And so the simple answer here is that the rise of the Emperor Constantine establishes Christianity as the central authorized religion of the empire and then marries or weds worldly power with spiritual authority, which creates as many problems as it solves for the previously persecuted uh, believers of the day. Okay, so chapter nine, huge, all about Constantine and his role in making Christian faith the legal and required faith of the Roman Empire. Chapter 10 
brings us back to um, the ongoing issues related to doctrine and heresies and misunderstanding of now a more systemized view, a more formalized and organized view of the Christian faith, specifically around the doctrine of the Trinity. This chapter called Splitting Important Hairs deals with how the doctrine of the Trinity becomes clarified. And the key question here is, what is the orthodox understanding of the triune God? What does Trinity really mean? And the key points um, relate to the focus of uh, more or less the unpacking of this incredible mystery of God in three persons by the Council of Nicaea in 325 and the affirmation of the fact that it's more of a mystery and less of a riddle to be solved, that really it's a transcendent mystery, meaning that it's really beyond human, full human comprehension to appreciate. It, it can't be uh, sort of reduced down to simple terms. We have to appreciate the mystery of this, um, you know, makeup of God, this composite sort of compilation of three persons in one, you know, God as as something that is, is beyond us, but is before us, you know. The mystery of the Trinity is found ultimately not even in the logistics or mechanics of the language or the conceptualization of the Trinity, but in the interpersonal relational love that's found between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in some ways in this chapter, you know, the, the author does a great job in making it clear that the mystery of the Trinity will never be fully resolved because you know, it's beyond human comprehension. On the other hand, it, it certainly becomes more clarified with the Council of Nicaea in that God is seen as one divine being in three persons, transcending the analogy of threes and the analogy of one, that is to say the social analogies that are offered in explanation or the psychological ones, leaving it then this reality of the Trinity in a place of revolutionary, uh, revelation, revelational, I should say, and revolutionary um, mystery that is transcendent, that the person of God ultimately cannot, cannot be by human, uh, you know, effort alone, fully comprehended, but he can be known, not fully, not completely, but substantially in his uh, one divine being, rooted in the three persons of the Godhead, okay? Chapter 11 um, deals with, again, another doctrinal point. It's called Emmanuel, or God with us, chapter 11, Christ and the Creeds. And the key question uh, is provoked within the realm of the church related to the incarnation of Christ that I mentioned to you earlier on. How did the classic doctrine of the incarnation come to be formulated, and what does it mean? You know, one of the things that I didn't make clear before, but I want to make abundantly clear now that the author makes abundantly clear, is that much of the orthodox um, witness of the church, that is to say the doctrine of the church that is considered to be true, central, real, and reliable, orthodox, comes from the provocation of heretics and heresies, misunderstandings, forcing people to to clarify what it is they believe about the true faith. So it's an interesting dynamic, um, and whether it's about Trinity or the incarnation, that is to say, the enfleshment of God in Jesus Christ, or many of the other ministry uh, mysteries, I should say, the virgin birth and so on, the miraculous nature of the revelation of God in Christ. You know, it's really heretics and misunderstandings found in heretical teaching that provokes the church to respond in a way that brings clarity and orthodoxy to bear. So the key points here revolve around the Christology uh, question of the New Testament, um, the heresies that rise in response, um, how the power play between the patriarchs or you know, the, um, the leaders of Rome uh, play into that, major heresies about 
Christ as carried in the nature heretics of uh, Apollinaris and Nestorius, with their um, misunderstandings provoke clarification, and then the establishing of the boundaries of the truth against Arius or Arian theology, defending Jesus as God against Apollinarius, defending Jesus as man, and against Eutychus, uh, establishing the divinity and the humanity equally within Jesus against Nestorius and his one person view of Christ gives us the reality of the mystery that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. And although that in and of itself as the incarnational reality is not fully comprehensible to the human mind, uh, gets affirmed in the various councils, four in total. You can look at that on page 123 in particular, give you some clarity about that. As they come around this question of um, the incarnation and how we understand it as official church council. So long story short, in chapter 11, the incarnation as it's classically understood as the coming of God fully in you know, the birth of a man who is fully human and fully divine at the same time, 100% of each, is affirmed finally and in the end by the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. And the unique man, that is to say God-man, who is Jesus Christ, both divine and human, uh, is established in the consciousness of the church and its theology and in its doctrine. Chapter 12, called Exiles from Life, begins another stage. So we've moved from the stage of heretics and the defining of orthodoxy and you know, the establishment of Christianity uh, within the power structure of the Roman Empire to uh, a place where the Roman Empire and its power and corruption begin to have many adverse effects on the Christian population to the point where a lot of you know, believers want to withdraw from that. They want to become more isolated and focus on a more pure set of expressions of the faith versus, quote unquote, the Roman popular expressions, which often lead to all kinds of immorality and problems and issues and power abuse and so on. And so the idea of monks and monasticism, retreating to a monastery, pulling back from human culture, becoming disengaged so as to, you know, um, purify oneself in the faith, uh, kind of becomes the big issue. In this chapter, the author covers the monastic ideal, the idea of the concept of retreating, you know, the self from human compromise and corruption, and um, living literally life as a hermit. Um, the move to a more communal expression or monastic expression of that becomes part of the dialogue where, um, you know, pure uh, hermit-like life, which a lot of monastics embrace, is not seen as the ideal, but rather monastic life in the context of a, a small community of people, all of whom are doing the same thing, becomes a version or a variation on the monastic theme. And so that's explored and begins to find expression and establishment in this period. And the Benedictine rule, uh, what's called the genius of the West, uh, St. Benedict's rule of order for the monastic life uh, is given birth and will last for, for hundreds of years after this as an influence on how to live in the idealized forms of Christian community that on the one hand are withdrawn from the corruption of human culture in general, but on the other are not the life of the hermit who lives out in the desert all by themselves or on the end of a, a flagpole, you know, on a platform and has to be fed with a stick, literally happened, um, you know, and, and this whole idea of a more cellular 
not by way of phones, but by way of separation, a cellular expression of a more pure Christian community uh, living in monasteries out, you know, in the middle of nowhere becomes kind of the, the thing. There are pros and cons to all of that, and the chapter explores those. But the answer to the question about the role of monasticism is that it existed at a critical time of formation for Western civilization and the church as it encompassed Western civilization and became embedded in it, but was more of the exception than the rule. And ultimately will always find certain expressions, this idea of withdrawing, not unlike the Essene community in the early or first century world, where you know you have these sectarian groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes who withdrew to you know a monastery to protect the scriptures and keep their purity and wait for God to show up and fix all of their problems. This monastic idea is not a new one, but it um, kind of comes to a head in this period and becomes more clearly defined and will make its uh, impact known for generations to follow right on through the Middle Ages. And um, with all of that, though, is seen as a variation on the theme of the Christian faith, not as its primary way of expression. So that's important to know that, you know, monks and monasteries are an expression of the Christian faith, but not a primary one. And while we go through a period in time in the Roman Empire at this moment, where that you know is really thoroughly explored as the way to live it ultimately will not be the way that most christians live uh, primarily because it ignores the entire call that we have as christians to engage the world again to be in the world but not of the world to be engaged with seeing people come into the kingdom of god and put their faith and trust in jesus christ but not be so separated from the world that we can't get that done or live a life that demonstrates Christ in us as a witness to our neighbors. Okay. So that's chapter 12. All right. Chapter 13. Let's all take a big breath. We've got 21 chapters. So we're more than halfway there. It's, I know a lot of material. I hope that you're tracking along uh, well with it and that this is helpful to you. We'll take a big breath. Chapter 13, the Sage of the Ages. One of my favorite chapters in that Augustine is one of my favorite characters from all of church history. Super interesting guy. And his uh, life and his impact as an intellectual and as a, a faithful believer really begins um, the long protracted period where Rome is collapsing and the fall of the Roman Empire is creating a, a crisis of civilization in the West. So the key question of this particular chapter is, the fall of the Roman Empire created a crisis, was the end of the world at hand? And Augustine himself, even towards the end of his life, was persuaded to believe that it was, although we all know now that it wasn't. Um, so was it or wasn't it is the question that faces the people of Augustine's time and Augustine's uh, immense intellectual and spiritual capacity and his role as a contributor to the life of faith within the institutionalized church is, um, is taken on in this chapter. One of the most famous conversion stories in all of history opens the chapter. Uh, this idea of him, you know, being a pagan and sexually immoral and kind of this rich, spoiled brat who, you know, is struggling in life and then has this supernatural encounter. You should read it. You should memorize it. It's one of the great testimonies of a believer coming to Christ in all of human and church history. Leads to his involvement then as um, an emerging leader in the church and the Donatist controversy the fallacy of a pure church versus the role of the priest and minister becomes a point of tension. Um, the issue here is that, you know, do people in the church have to be perfect or is the church filled with imperfect people who are saved? Again, this is not a new uh, question. It's not a new um, 
struggle or tension point. Today, it's still an issue that we grapple with ongoingly in our life, in the community of faith that we call the church. And the role of ministers and pastors and priests even today is characterized by an expectation that spiritual leaders ought to be better than the rest of us in some real tangible substantive ways and yet oftentimes we discover they're not and so how does that all work in terms of our own walk of faith and so on and so forth uh, that conversation really begins in earnest in the life in times of augustine in this donatist controversy of sin and grace the pelagian controversy how are we saved is it by grace alone or by works becomes a big issue and point of contention, and Augustine contributes mightily to that conversation. And then he ends his life um, contributing this idea as written in his book, The City of God, that the, the, the rule and reign of God is really meant to establish itself um, in some substantive way in human culture, although the ideal city of God is seen at least by Augustine, as a separate entity from human civilization. And again, he, he sort of extrapolates this Donatist controversy of the reality of human, the human condition, even post-conversion, and how that works itself out in real life, as related to the promises of God and the full realization and culmination of the kingdom on the one hand and the city of God, and on the other, in the real life, real time, you know, human expressions of civilization and um, human experience on the street. No, says Augustine, uh, to the end of the world question ultimately, um, and he establishes the philosophical foundations for Christendom impacting Christian thought and practice to the current day. The eternal city, which is how Rome was known, replaced by the city of God. In other words, what Augustine brings to the, to the big picture is that he, for the first time in human history, relative to the church and to the Christian experience, brings a, a, an intelligent, comprehensive, well-formulated philosophical framework for the Christian worldview. That's Augustine's in the city of God and other works and other contributions. That's Augustine's uh, major um, breakthrough. That's his contribution to the church and to human culture. That's what he's most known for. He builds a philosophical framework, making sense of the Christian experience for the wider intellectual philosophical world in such a way, in such a complete way, that it's, it's never quite been seen like that before, and it shapes <clears throat> philosophical thought, human intellectual development and thought relative to the faith from that day forward. Okay, so big deal, huge guy, makes a huge contribution, and that's um, where Augustine's impact begins, and it continues from there even after he dies. In chapter 14, um, opens up the question of the papacy, the Pope. Uh, Peter as Pontifus Maximus is the title. And this chapter explores what the foundation of the papal office, that is to say, in the Catholic, capital C, institutional church, we all know that it's headed by the Pope. Um, how, did, how did the Catholic Church and all of its institutional formalism uh, come up with the idea that it was to be led by a pope, and then more so, how does it trace back the authority of the pope to the apostles? And of course, we all know it's traced back to Peter and <clears throat> his confession up in Caesarea Philippi that Jesus um, responds to and establishes for all the universe to read in the Gospels that uh, Jesus himself will build his church on Peter. You know, that, that whole line of thought is explored in detail and articulated here in chapter 14. The key points are the Roman Catholic claim that Peter was really the first pope and that from Peter all the other popes are derived. How they work that out is interesting and too much to talk about in this moment, but 
You can get a flavor for it in the chapter. And it begins um, a, a period in time, interestingly, um, you know, we're layering back in time now to Constantine and his move to Byzantium, but Constantinople in the east, in what will become ultimately uh, Turkey, uh, its establishment as the, the capital of the empire, or the new Rome, it becomes a complicating factor that will undergird and lead to ultimately what we'll see in the <clears throat> Great Schism of 1054, which is the separation of Eastern and Western Orthodoxy. Um, there's a tracing of popes, including primarily Leo, Pope Leo's case for the primacy of the papacy based on the mantle that Peter hands down. You can explore that in that chapter. And then also uh, what happens when the Vandals and Attila the Hun, first Attila, then the Vandals, begin to sack Rome. And you start to see, again, what will become the long, protracted, painful, uh, ultimate collapse of the Roman Empire over hundreds of years, beginning in earnest now, even as the, the uh, you know, the the power of the Pope and the papacy becomes more and more acutely known. Um, the answer to the question, how is the foundation of papal off office laid, is answered with Bishop Leo's contribution to the transfer of authority from Roman politics to Roman church channels and Peter's authority into the Roman papacy. It's complicated, it's in chapter 14, but ba basically it's this meshing of political and religious power that becomes, for better or for worse, and there's ample examples of both, um, a really influential dynamic in the collapse of the Roman Empire. On the one hand, the power and authority of the Pope, uh, through various events that we'll see in the chapters ahead, will make a huge difference in perpetuating the Roman Empire. Uh, by contrast, the political corruption that is brought into sort of establishing the Pope as both religious and political final authority becomes hugely problematic. And, you know, we'll see the outworkings of that. So, you know, this whole question of the role of the Pope and is the Pope strictly religious or is he political? Is he both, you know, becomes really kind of the central issue in this chapter and how that affects both the survival of and the collapse from within and from without of the Roman Empire over generations um, is also seen. All right, in chapter 15, somewhere between heaven and earth, we move into an exploration of what's mostly a, a not very well understood or explored reality of church uh, history. And that is the emergence of the Eastern Orthodox tradition and its ultimate separation from the West. What is Eastern Orthodoxy becomes the question of the chapter. And in brief, Bruce Shelley uh, describes and explores the differences between um, what's emerging uh, through Constantine's influence and the influence of Constantinople or the New Rome um, uh, what's now called Istanbul, the capital of Turkey, uh, in, back in the day, its political and religious influence over that segment of the Roman Empire. Remember that the Roman Empire extends from Spain, you know, all the way to India. I mean, it's a huge, for the day and even for our own day, geographical expanse, you know, governing and and exerting power and, and authority and control and a standing army and and you know so on and so forth I mean just the management of this empire is enormous enormously complicated and fraught with problems and what what begins to happen is that in every way slowly but surely the East and its culture you know, in the dividing line there in the Middle East, more or less, with Turkey being kind of the center uh, boundary line, and the West, Italy, Rome, uh, what will become ultimately the Roman penetration of 
of the European continent. You know, the cultures are so different. The geographical expanse is so wide. The, you know, the, the societies are moving further and further apart in their orientation that the church, in essence, follows suit. And the, the Western and Eastern expressions of the faith and orthodoxy begin to, because of where they're rooted more than anything else, and the political forces at work, and the deconstruction of the West, both internally and externally by way of the pressure of invading forces, creates a situation where really two very different orientations on the Christian faith emerge. And what's interesting about it, there's a lot of interesting things that we can't get into, but what's interesting about it is that in the West, the Catholic Church really sees, and then the Protestant tradition that emerges from it, the gospel as a more legally rooted um, reality. That is to say, more individualistic, more rooted in the idea that God as the ultimate you know, moral authority of the universe and the perfect being has been offended by our sin and needs to uh, be appeased in that offense and that there's a, a reconciliation that takes place in the death and resurrection of Christ that sort of legally invites us into a reestablished relationship with Christ. You know, if you're careful to examine closely the message of the gospel in most Protestant churches and certainly in Catholic churches, it's, it's a lot of legal concept that's really at work in the justification of sinners and in salvation itself as it comes by way of reconciliation with uh, the merciful God who judges his son in our own place. As opposed to Eastern Orthodoxy, which is really rooted in the idea of the image of God and the image of man created in the image of God, as those images have been degraded and deconstitutionalized, um, uh, sort of broken down, to use simpler language, and the reconstitution of those images um, by way of Christ's work and the power of the Holy Spirit, so that in the East, the role of the Holy Spirit, not the role of the cross and the crucifixion becomes central. And the reconstitution of the image of man in relation to the reconstituted image of God and the work of Christ becomes the major focus point. In that, the artistic and religious expressions of iconography, the idea of icons uh, representing and, and serving as a window into the spiritual realm of this reconstitutional effort of God by virtue of the Holy Spirit to repair things becomes kind of the, the set of practices as compared to what we see in Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. So it's really an interesting thing. The will of God in human society becomes, and his activity therein, becomes really the, the big set of issues at hand in the chapter, we'll talk about, you know, the developments that involve both of those realms and the division therein and the rise of the, the issue of the icons and how the Roman expression of the church deals with that and ultimately what will lead to um, the gap between East and West, uh, you know, sort of widening to the point where the bull of excommunication, which is a written proclamation sent by Pope Leo to the East formalizes what will become known in what we refer to as the Great Schism, the Great Division between East and West Orthodoxies in 1054. Um, the answer is, and I think Joe brought this up in our conversation on Thursday night last, uh, the answer to this question of what Eastern Orthodoxy is, is that it's a complicated expression of 15 denominations that follow Constantine's migration to the East and the separation of the, the origin points of what the gospel really means in human culture. I mentioned Joe because he asked that question, a really good one related to denominations, and denominations in particular that bring a sense of uh, frustration and division to the unbelieving world as it looks at Protestant Christianity in the modern setting. 
Well, I mention that because denominationalism actually begins here uh, in, in a very real way within the Catholic tradition. I know it sounds funny to say that, but look into the chapter and see if you don't see the beginnings of what will become the Protestant expression of all the variations of belief systems and traditions and streams that you see in formal and informal denominationalism. It really starts way back here within the, the, the great schism at the, the turn of the first millennium where Catholicism and even Eastern Orthodoxy um, is fractured within itself. In other words, the Eastern and Western traditions of the faith fracture, and within those distinct Eastern and Western segments, there's fracturing, to the point that you could call it, in a very real way, denominationalism, which continues even to the present day. The Protestants, in breaking off from the, the Catholics in, you know, the 1500s and starting an entirely different movement, really carry with them this fractured, inner fractured state of disagreement. And so um, I just want to point out to you that in this chapter, we get the very bare beginnings of what will later become questions related to how we relate um, in the modern and late modern era through all the different expressions of Protestant faith derived from the Reformation itself, okay? All right, we're gonna wrap this up here in the next few chapters. I'm gonna move more quickly here and see if we can get her done. Uh, chapter 16, Bending the Necks of the Victors, is um, about the barbarian invasions from the north, from uh, the Germanic countries, the Franks and so on, um, who, uh, ultimately, interestingly, become evangelized by people like Ulfilus and St. Patrick and other missionaries sent from the collapsing Roman Empire up into uh, the European wilderness, as it were. But the barbarians, on the one hand, are coming in and invading Rome and tearing apart the civilization. On the other, Christianity is penetrating back into these pagan environments and and you know, through some miraculous events, which are outlined in the chapter, as well as a slow penetration of, you know, vibrant witness of the Christian faith, we see a transformation happening on the European continent. And so there's a lot of discussion in the key points about the coming of the barbarians, missions north, people like St. Patrick who were sent to the UK and Ireland, in, this, in his case, to evangelize and to start monasteries. You know, there's this whole exchange of political and spiritual engagement and power that revolutionizes uh, the entire continent and basically Christianizes and makes Europe a Christian or Christendom-like civilization. So ultimately, the gospel as it spreads upward to the collapse of the Roman Empire and the conversion of the European uh, pagan um, population is really the business of uh, you know the supernatural and and um, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for it's it's sort of the upturning of expectations the kind of um, not, there's a word I'm looking for that I can't quite find but um, it, it's really the the subversive, that's the word I'm looking for, the subversive power of the gospel on display. That while Rome is collapsing and the barbarians are creating havoc and, and Europe is still a raw, you know, violent place, the, you know, the, the Christian faith penetrates back into that least of all likely of culture sets to convert to the faith and converts them. <laughs> and so, therefore, sets the foundation for what will ultimately become European civilization. Chapter 16 gives way to, to the last major division in this lecture, anyway, which is Division 4, and that is the Christian Middle Ages, the time spanning from 590 to 1517, and that sets us up in our next lecture for the Reformation and what happens after that. So, as you could gather thus far, Europe owes more to the Christian faith than most people realize as, as 
I began to describe just then. The barbarians destroyed the Roman Empire in the West, but it was the Christian church that put together a new order called Europe. The church took the lead in rule by law, the pursuit of knowledge, expressions of culture. The underlying concept was Christendom, which united empire and church. It began under Charlemagne in the 8th century, but the popes, who were still active, even though the, you know, the empire was collapsing, slowly assumed more and more power until Innocent III taught Europe to think of the popes as world rulers. Interestingly, with the collapse of the Roman Empire, the leadership of the Catholic Church becomes dominant in this newly converted and converting European wilderness, and so, you know, the power of the papacy really shifts into Europe, which is a fascinating, uh, fascinating thing. Later centuries, however, saw the popes corrupted by power and increasingly militant reformers crying out for change. One thing I want to point out here, I mentioned kind of sloppily in our discussion the first Thursday night, and that is Richard Halverson, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, is known for a quotation that he made that goes something like this. When the Greeks got the gospel, they turned it into a philosophy. When the Romans got the gospel, they turned it into an institution. When the Europeans got the gospel, they turned it into a culture. And when the Americans got the gospel, they turned it into a business. Um, I like that quote, and it relates to opening up, you know, Division Four here in the Christian Middle Ages, in highlighting the fact that the gospel you and I have to understand, and therefore the church as its formalized institutional expression of organized community of believers, right? The derivative of the kingdom of God ultimately, the evidence left behind as it were, is always interpenetrated by the culture, whatever culture it finds itself in. And as we just saw in this crazy development of European rise in history and the collapse of Rome, it penetrates back. So on the one hand, the gospel, the kingdom of God, and its birthright, the community of believers who then formulate churches, penetrates human culture. That is to say, it draws its target, right, of human beings from human culture and converts them, and thereby, thereby uh, penetrates human culture and transforms it. At the same time, that same human culture backwashes into the church, backwashes into the community of believers and into the gospel, right? And so you have this interplay that is both good and bad, both destructive and, and constructive, uh, wherein the gospel is changing people and people in human culture is flavoring the gospel. And I like the Halverson quote because it describes different ways that human culture in the biggest sweep of history have flavored the gospel in certain ways. And how that in turn, like if you think about the phrase, when the Americans got the gospel, they turned it into a business, right? Uh, flavors how we do life as believers in the community of faith and the organization, organization or the institutional format of the church. So let's bring this home to a point of application here. Think about what we're going through right now with this pandemic in the 21st century. Largely, and I'm not being critical, I'm just being descriptive. If it's true that Americans have turned the gospel into a business and there are you know, some compelling evidences toward uh, at least, if not turning it into a business, flavoring it with a corporate and business mindset and entrepreneurial sort of emphasis and focus. We are ne now being challenged in this time of social distancing and virtual church, right, to reconceptualize what it means to do the business of church, no pun intended. <laughs> I mean, it's a fascinating thing that in many ways, the more cynical amongst us might describe church as nothing more than an organization that sells Jesus as a product. And there's some truth to that. Collecting tithes and counting, as pastors like to say, but don't like to admit, nickels and noses, right, to validate their existence by way of people engaging in church, showing up on Sunday, serving, worshiping, participating, and giving. That's what makes the organization of the church run in America. 
we're now being challenged to reconceive all of that um, and to, to rethink what is it that undergirds this thing that we Americans call church that clearly has transformed all of our lives through the penetration of the gospel and the leading of us all into a relationship with Jesus, amen and thank God. But on the flip side, we've also transformed and changed and flavored by way of conducting the formal institutional expressions of the church in a very business or corporate sort of focus and mindset. So I'm bringing that up for obvious reasons, that we're now living, folks, those of us who are in ministry actively in a time where how we think about and do church, right, is shifting and changing potentially. That's not a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing, but it's a thing. <laughs> and it relates to this interplay between human beings, uh, their culture, and the power of the kingdom of God and the gospel and its impact. All right, so I'm going to leave it there because we have to keep moving along to chapter 17 and, and finish this out. But I wanted to bring that up as another point of relevance for this course, that thinking about church history and the interplay between the kingdom of God and the culture of man is a never-ending and interesting uh, topic to spend some time on. It's super relevant to where, where we're even living right now, some of the, the challenges that we're facing in the church in this pandemic era today are even highlighted by that. Chapter 17 then, God's Consul or Gregory the Great. This is a later um, sort of middle age, uh, middle ages period of, of church history that we're now embarking into. The key question in this chapter is the role of Gregory, uh, a most critical of all popes who comes into his um, station, his his role as a as a papal officer, as the Pope, in a particularly troubled and difficult and challenged time in uh, the Roman collapse and the rise of, of European culture. Um, you know, Gregory cannot be in his uh, impact and his, his um, role as a leader who helps the the influence of the church to translate from the Roman political environment to the European, uh, you know, sort of context. He, his, his role and his contribution can't be overstated. But the question is, how and what did Christianity bring to the devastation of Rome in order to contribute or to be a part of the rebirth from its ashes as Christian Europe? How did all that take place? Well, there's more information there that can be discussed even in the chapter, but this chapter is all about that and deals with this person called Gregory the Great, ultimately, who is a pope. His place in history is a master of Augustine theology and Benedict, uh, St. Benedict's order or Benedictine order in the monastery. He kind of combines those two things and other things to bring order out of chaos and to pick up the pieces of the collapsing empire and translate those into uh, ultimately what will become so much of the foundation religious and civic and otherwise of the European culture as it rises. He's a missionary statesman. He's the first monastic pope. So again, with this idea of Augustine and Benedict in mind, he's one who is focused on the purity of the of the believer's life at the same time the evangelistic nature of it he's a defender of the orthodoxy this you know the system of belief that has been so you know thoroughly and and um, energetically fought for generationally down through the the life of the roman empire and the rise of the catholic church and its preeminence in the empire and now the collapse of the one and the transformation of the other into a, a huge force to influence the European experience. So through it all, the, the committed and humble devotion and zealous missionary effort of this key figure, Pope Gregory, really spearheads and bridges this critical time in European history and brings the gospel to bear on an entirely new continent, really. You know, I mean, Italy is a part of Europe, obviously, but it, 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 it really just translates the whole Christian influence in Christendom 
as a foundation for human society into the larger context of the European uh, continent itself. That then uh, is extended by Charlemagne in chapter 18, the search for unity in Charlemagne and Christendom becomes the topic of exploration, how Europe begins to rise as, you know, in, in, in a, a really key way, an expression of Augustine's city of God, a, 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 a more and more sophisticated civilization built on a Christian foundation, uh, basically is what we're talking about here. The key question in chapter 18 is, how did the kingdom of God become so interwoven in the rule of men in the medieval age? Well, there are reasons for it. It'll, in this chapter, explore those reasons, but the chaos and the tumultuous um, nature of this transitional period between Rome's demise and Europe's rise gives rise to the to the leader, the King Charlemagne, who in the 700s makes a, as huge an impact, arguably, as Pope Gregory. He's the architect of more or less the European empire. And he, you know, sort of is the follow on from Pope Gregory as the power and influence of the Catholic Church begins to penetrate in a very real way the foundation of the now formulating European. Uh, complicated but now more civilized and sophisticated culture. Feudalism becomes a huge part of this, the arrangement between rulers and their vassals, how land is devote, uh, divided up, how wealth is dealt with, how military defense and advancement is executed, all becomes a part of the feudal system which is the underlying complex, sophisticated network system that undergirds like a, a kind of a, a mosaic, you know, sort of the human culture of, of Europe. Ultimately, you know, feudalism will give rise, if you remember your world history, to the idea of nation states, but that's well down the road from what we're talking about now. Really, it's the way people organize and defend themselves and make a living and survive in medieval Europe that's interpenetrated with the power of the Catholic Church and how the Catholic Church, you know, really plays a humongous role in seeing Europe and its intellectual and social and commercial life develop. Um, and the idea that Europe unifies itself around the church and that the church itself uh, becomes for better or worse, the dominating force in medieval Europe. And on the one hand, sets the foundation for what will become modern Europe, but on the other, creates its own problems, which lead very shortly to the Protestant Reformation, amongst other things. So the answer to the question is, beginning with Gregory and extending through Charlemagne, Europe is penetrated by the concept of the city of God on earth in medieval society. Um, very simply, the blending of, again, in a European context, the power of human culture and the dynamic power of the kingdom of God in its rebirthing, you know, outworking, and, and, and then the institutionalization of the church as a byproduct of that. You know, in effect, it's um, Rome all over again, but in a European context. But that's an oversimplification. It's, it's this idea of the interweaving of everyday life on the street and the formulation of human culture with the power and influence of the gospel as carried forth by the institutional church. Chapter 19, Lifted in a Mystic Manner, is all about what happens next in medieval history where uh, Christendom, as it is rising across the continent, is threatened by um, this thing called Islam, which emerges in the East and ultimately will take out the Eastern Orthodox Empire, that is to say the Eastern Orthodox political framework that was Rome, whereas Rome as an empire in the West collapses over the course of many generations and ultimately goes away leaving Europe to rise in its place in the East. You have the Eastern expression of the Roman Empire, which religiously becomes Eastern Orthodoxy collapsing, leaving Eastern Orthodox religion in place, but dominated by the Muslim uh, 
influence. And that leads to occupation of the geography of the Holy Land in particular, but lots of areas and regions in the East in such a way that provokes the West to launch crusades. And, you know, the key question here becomes what can Christians expect when they try to bring uh, to life God's kingdom on earth? Well, in, in many ways, in militaristic and politically driven ways, you know, the crusades are all about trying to dominate Islam with the Christian uh, Christendom concept. And it leads to violence, it leads to war, it leads to ultimately seven different crusades. It leads to the rise of in Islam and the division between Sunni and Shiite Muslims, which we still see active in various ways today in the Middle East and in the conflicts therein, right? It leads to, um, you know, uh, this, this, what ultimately will be failure of political Christian civilization to dominate through military might the um, consciousness of an entirely different region of the world and, and the people that live there. And there are imperfections of saved but sinful man as he tries to revolutionize human culture, at least in the East, through military might into a more Christian expression. So that's a long and complicated way of saying that when Europe tries to advance Christendom through all the wrong tools of military, violence, you know, politics, and so on, it fails miserably. And yet in the West, um, the church and the Christian faith still dominates in its influential power. The next chapter deals with the scholastic or academic or intellectual dimension of that sort of what you might call Christian triumphalism. Scholasticism is all about the rise of the university system. The intellectual life is driven by an individual named Thomas Aquinas, ultimately. Um, and uh, the more formalized uh, educational system that will be, you know, sort of expressed ultimately in the university system, which is now Many generations hence evolved quite a bit from the original concept, but the idea is that the same, you know, effort that people put into the Crusades to use political and military power to force Christian witness on other human beings is, in a sense, attempted through intellectual advancement, uh, so that there's a kind of uh, intellectual crusaderism that goes on with scholasticism. Not all bad, not all destructive, but ultimately fails as miserably as uh, political and military crusaderism in really bringing, you know, true transformation to the human mind of the Christian worldview and reality as advanced by Augustine and Benedict and now ultimately Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas' big failure, of course, is that he believed in the fall of mankind, except that the intellect of man was not affected by the fall that occurs in the Garden of Eden. And of course, that's wrong. The intellect of man is affected by the fall, but you understand the self-serving reason why he would think that if he's at the spear point of advancing intellectualism and scholasticism in Europe in the Middle Ages, he doesn't want to be hindered by the idea that, you know, human intellect is flawed, that everything that comes through the mind actually is holy and from God. And so, you know, that becomes sort of his selling point. And um, so, you know, in chapter 20, the big question, how was human reason made the servant of faith is really the issue at hand. And I, I've just given you kind of a summary of that chapter. You can look at the rise of the universities and the magnetism, the effect of able teachers within the university, and then how the, the papal monarchy, that is to say the structure of the leadership of the popes, benefits from that scholasticism in terms of empowering the popes even more so in medieval culture in Europe in the time to uh, exert influence. And then the peak of uh, rational reach through Aquinas and his work. 
All that to say that the answer to the question, how was human reason made the servant of faith, is that like the Crusades, it wasn't really. Scholasticism fails by claiming too much and reaching too far. And in a nutshell, the issue is, in the university, through able teachers who are really, at the end of the day, attempting and succeeding in getting their students to think, what they gave birth to was not just a Christian worldview that was well intellectualized and, and built in a philosophical framework vis-a-vis uh, St. Augustine, but you also then created a, an intellectual momentum that will lead to the Reformation, uh, the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, the rise of humanism, and all the stuff that transforms, ironically enough, Europe from a foundation of Christendom to what it is today, which is largely a foundational foundation of secularism, rooted in the idea of the separation between human intellect and human spirituality. So again, ironically, Aquinas gives birth to, on the one hand, a strong scholastic movement rooted in the Christian worldview and tradition, but on the other, in teaching people to think, uh, you know, the layers and generations of university um, level instructors will give birth to the rise of intellectual independence and a separation in the human mind of the powers of the human intellect from, you know, the human need to rely on faith in Christ alone. That's a far more complicated uh, sort of topic than I just um, was able to fully express, but I think you get the idea. And so this is the beginnings, you know, of what will ultimately transform Europe away from, ironically enough, the foundations of the Christian faith. Okay, the last chapter in this presentation, we're almost done, the lecture here, chapter 21, A Song to Lady Poverty, deals with the rise of a counter response to crusaderism and scholasticism and, and the, you know, sort of overt domination of the Christian faith and all aspects of uh, European and other societies, or at least the attempt to, to see that happen with the, the rise of a more simplified uh, anti-institutional expression of the faith as um, characterized and embodied in a person called Francis of Assisi. The age of Francis of Assisi ushers in the popularity of the poverty-stricken monk who, you know, lives a simple life and talks to the animals and is in harmony with nature and, you know, is kind of getting back to the basics of the Christian faith as originally seen in the person of the rabbi from Nazareth, Jesus Christ. So the question in this chapter, and it ends the lecture, is, is true Christianity found in the church, in the institution of the church, and all of its power and authority and crusaderism and intellectualism and so on? Or is it found in the simple life of a self-denying individual who takes a vow of poverty and just wants to live a simple and harmonious life, loving people, serving their neighbor, and so on, and uh, expressing, you know, the faith that way. And I won't go into all the details because, you know, we need to wrap this up, but there is a, a great deal of uh, six different sections in this chapter of, of detail that sort of describe why this is important and what tensions, which are not new, but are now newly emerging, that have already emerged early in ch church history are reoccurring in tensions between how we handle our politics and power and our daily relations, you know, what purity and holiness looks like in real life, what we do with people who are struggling in sin, and can we consider them to be truly, you know, Christians. Heresies start to re-emerge and, and, and um, provoke again discussion of orthodoxy. You know, it's in many ways, it's the um, revisiting of a lot of issues that are now kind of coming to head in European society that earlier on came to a head in Roman society. But the answer to the question is the tension is raised and answered really in the person of Francis of Assisi, but continues even into the present day as a tension within the church between 
what's the best and most effective Christian witness? One that's formally institutionalized in this organization we call the church, or one that's more individualized, more uh, intimate, more simple, more personal in the life of a solitary monk, you know, just out there in the world trying to make a difference uh, and an impact on his neighbors. Again, nothing new here, but a very unique and distinct chapter of medieval history that involves this guy, uh, Francis of Assisi, in, in a big way. Okay? All right, that's the first 21 chapters of Bruce Shelley's book, chapter by chapter, question by question. I hope that it's been helpful to you. Again, um, I hope that, you know, it's, it's brought uh, to a point of clarification a lot of what you've hopefully been able to read. Uh, do yourself a favor when you're reading the Shelley book, uh, do try to highlight for yourself some of the major um, division summaries. Go through and skim and scan the chapters quickly. Read the first and the last paragraphs, first sections, last sections of each chapter. If you can't read the whole book word for word, try to scan it and what I call college read it. That is to say, you know, get a gist for every chapter, the main question, use you know the slideshow that I just gave you as a guide, and, and just get a general sense of what's taking place in the flow of church history. For our purposes in this class, that's about the best we can do. And if you'll take a little time and energy to just just you know stay like a like a like a rock skipping across the top of a pond, right? When you throw it a flat rock, you just stay to the high points and the in the major developments and the major flow and the questions answered and the answers provided. You get a sense of a workable, relevant, you know, sort of appreciation for church history. None of us are going to get a PhD probably in church history at this point. And we don't need to, but we do need to have, you know, kind of a general sensibility about it all and why it's important to consider and what some of the, the major developments are and the questions that are on the table at any given point and how it flows. And so I hope that, you know, this will go a long way to helping you with that. All right. Okay. We'll see you on Thursday night. Uh, April 16th, we'll talk some. Prepare some questions and send them to me by email, if you would, before we get to that discussion. If you look on Canvas, you'll see my email is there. Also, my email is in the syllabus, drg.adjunct.gmail.com. Send, send some questions ahead of time so I can be, pre be prepared to lead you through conversation and discussion about answering some of those questions. Uh, really what I know will be important questions relative to all this history, okay? Thanks for, thanks for listening.